Did we get it to a live stream? Uh, yeah, I mean, the one from the US. The YouTube, yeah, which running. I tweeted and let the world know. <laughs> it's that it is. It says it is live. I mean, it should. And what camera is it using? Well, we're not having a camera. So it's just audio. Yeah, and the screen. We could put it on the floor, though, if you want. Yeah, you could put it on the floor, so because people are expecting. It's up to you if it works. So. Yeah, let's give it a try.
First of all, welcome everyone here. It's really great to see that uh, so many of you made it here. Um, um, yeah, before we start with the uh, lecture and uh, welcome our speaker, we would like to give our president, Marco Neyway, the chance uh, to explain a bit of what Master Skills and Liberty is about and uh, what we do, what kind of events we organize. Um, yeah, please give him a round of applause, Marco Neyway. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Patrick. Um, so, for those who don't know, uh, I'm Isabel, and so that's not a shame, by the way. We just are in our second year uh, as an organization. So, um, we as uh, MSFL, we are an interfaculty student association. Um, we promote the ideas of liberty um, in personal, social, and in economic contexts, and we do that by uh, organizing uh, debates, lectures as tonight, and, um, well, we uh, are delivering food for thought. We want people to uh, think uh, critically about the status quo, and uh, we want to challenge you all uh, to also do that, uh, uh, to ask questions during the Q&A. Uh, we will have uh, an hour of Q&A, uh, so that will be uh, enough. Um, and after that, if it's not enough, we're going to have a social at, uh, at uh, the tribunal. Uh, so you can, uh, where Dr. Brook is also joining us, so you can uh, join us there to uh, uh, have a conversation further about the evening. So to tell a bit about our upcoming events, um, we've got on the 3rd of November an interesting lecture um, with a debate uh, about Catalonia, the independence of Catalonia. They are voting on the 9th uh, of uh, November. Um, on the 6th of November, we've got uh, Olof Deemat. Uh, he's going to uh, take us to an uh, other um, perspective, a unique perspective uh, about the economics. He's going to tell about uh, causes and cures of the economic crisis and uh, from an Austrian economic uh, perspective. Um, and on the 11th of November, and I'm very ha happy to, uh, to announce this, we've got the Prince of uh, Liechtenstein uh, to speak about her event about entrepreneurship, the future of entrepreneurship. And on the 26th of November, uh, we've got the case for open borders uh, with Lynn Schneider. Um, do we need to have open borders, yes or no? That said, um, I want to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Brook. He is from, he is pre uh, currently president and executive director of the Iron Rand Institute. He holds an uh, MBA, MBA and a PhD in uh, finance, uh, seven-time professor winning uh, award received in, in the past, so that's, that's quite an uh, accomplishment. Um, so I'm uh, very looking forward to uh, add Dr. Brook. Um, Dr. Brook, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, SFL, for uh, ESFL, I guess, uh, for organizing MSFL, MESFL, something like that, uh, for organizing the event uh, today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a, a terrific, uh, terrific turnout, and uh, I'm glad to see all of you come to hear a talk about selfishness, right? That's the title of the talk, which is a real problem 
for me to be here to talk about selfishness. Because what have we all been taught about selfishness? What do I know you all coming here thinking about, right? What does it mean? What does it mean to be selfish? What will we be taught from when we very little, very small, by our mothers, by our fathers, by our preachers, by our university professors? What do we be taught that selfishness means? Means what? Something bad. Something bad, right? Selfishness is bad. In what way is it bad? Right? In what way is it bad? When we, when we, in the schoolyard, right? When we're in the schoolyard, and there's a kid and we say, you're selfish. Do we mean he's taking care of himself? Which is the literal definition, if you will, of selfishness? No. What do we mean? He's what? He's bad, but in what way is he bad? Well, evil is just another word for bad, <laughs> right? Give me, give me examples. What do they do? What, is, what, is, what does a selfish person actually do? Not yeah, they don't share, right? Number one, they don't share. Remember that. What else? Is it just that they don't do stuff? What do they do? They act in their own interest, which means what? They ignore others. You guys are way too benevolent. You're too nice. I don't know, when we called, in my schoolyard, when we called somebody selfish, we meant he was a lying, stealing, you know, backstabbing, SOB. And I'm not translating SOB. <laughs> so somebody who exploits other people. What we meant by being selfish was somebody who exploits other people, somebody who does anything to get his way. And it was the antithesis, the opposite of what it meant to be moral, to be good, to be virtuous, to be noble. Because what were we taught? What were we taught was morality? What were we taught was nobility, goodness, virtue? What, 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 is, what is morality? What is good? What is virtue? To do what? To share, right. to share, to give, to sacrifice. Right. We're taught from when we're this age. I mean, again, now, my mother taught me, right, to think of others first, to think of yourself last. That the purpose of morality was to teach you how to sacrifice. Sacrifice was noble. And sacrifice means what? Just so we're clear on what, what the terms that we're using mean. Sacrifice means giving something and expecting what in return? Nothing. Now, you guys better speak up because these two here, they're quite vocal and they'll dominate the evening. So yell because I can hear them. I can't hear you up there. Sacrifice means giving something up with the expectation of getting nothing in return or getting something less valuable in return. That's what sacrifice means. So we're taught from when we're very young that virtue, nobility, goodness needs to sacrifice. It means to be selfless. It means to place the well-being of other people ahead of your own well-being. To take care of others before you take care of yourself. Now that's just what we are taught. It's what our parents taught us again. It's what our preachers teach us in religion. And it's what our philosophy teachers teach us in philosophy classes, in ethics classes, in morality classes. Indeed, some philosophers have gone so far as to say that when you're doing something good for somebody else, if you think for a minute about how it could benefit you, it's not moral. So the whole point of morality the whole point of ethics is selflessness, is to deny self, is to place other people above self, to serve, to serve other people. And who are the others? Pick and choose. Usually, they're those in need, those who have less than you, those who don't have what you have. So their need Somebody's need, they're poor, they don't have health care, 
whatever the need happens to be, becomes a moral obligation on you. Why? Because you're alive. Because that's what goodness, morality, virtue demands. That's the definition we are taught. And indeed, I would say that we organize much of our economic life around us, or much of our lives generally around us. We are told that we must share. Share is a great word, because we learn it in the, in the, in the uh, sandbox, when our mothers tell us to share our toys with any strange kid who walks up. Right? Now, we figured out pretty early that our mother wouldn't share the car keys with any stranger that, that walked up and asked for the keys, right? But we still teach our kids that that's the ideal because it's the ideal of sharing. No matter who they are, they don't have a truck. You have a truck. It's your moral obligation to share that truck. And of course, when we're adults, we are expected to share our income. Now, we're not as benevolent enough to just have our mothers ask us to share the income. We use the state, which has big guns and big prisons, to force us to share that income. But it's all in the name of being good, being virtuous, being moral, being sharing. What's wrong with sharing? And we know, we know, that if we leave people alone, they won't share enough. At least not enough based on our standards and based on the needs of some people. Because they are being too, what? They don't share enough, why? Because they're being too? Selfish. So we have to force them to share. We have to coerce them into sharing. Because they're going to be too selfish. They'll think only of themselves. They won't take care of other people if we don't force them to do so. So much of our economic system, certainly the entire welfare state, is predicated on the idea that the moral, the just, the right thing to do is to sacrifice, to give, to help without expecting anything in return. Those who have should give to those who don't. That's the moral thing to do. And all the state is doing, all the government is doing, is making sure that they behave based on the morally accepted behavior. So we're using a little bit of coercion to get people to be good, noble, just. And that's because it's their moral duty. It's their moral obligation based on all this morality that we've learned. We also, we also observe right, that how do people behave in the marketplace when we, when we send them out to the market? What, what do we know about businessmen, for example? Why are they going to business? Why does Steve Jobs build this? What's that? To make money, right? To make money, these things have a nice profit margin. 60, 65%. There's a lot of money in this, right? Now, is it only about making money? Is it only about making money? No. No, what else? Ingenuity. Yeah, he loves this, right? He loves the innovation, the ingenuity, the beauty of it. So there's passion. There's passion. But whose passion is this? Steve's, right? You know him, huh? <laughs> <laughs> to him, he's just Steve. Steve jobs to me, but that's okay. So this. This is about Steve Jobs. This is about making money for Steve Jobs. This is about Steve Jobs' passion. This is about Steve Jobs loving what he do, wanting, wanting to be innovative, wanting to be the best he can be. This is all about Steve. <laughs> I picked up on that. And, you know, I like to tell the story when I bought my first iPhone, which I did in 2008 as the economy was spiraling out of control. I wanted to stimulate the US economy. That's why I went shopping. Because I know, I know. I know you're all good citizens, you're all good people. And when you go shopping, you're going shopping because you care about your fellow man and you want to make sure they have jobs. That's why you buy the nice shoes. That's why you buy the latest toy. That's why you get your phone, right? No. I'm not going to ask who shops for that reason. I don't want to embarrass you. 
We go shopping to make whose life better. Oh, I went to buy the iPhone because I thought this would make me more productive. I thought it was cool. I thought it would be fun. I thought a lot of things, but they were all about me. I didn't care if I was making a profit or not. I actually knew they were making a profit. I was fine with that. I bought the iPhone for 300 bucks. How much was it worth to me? At least that, much more than that, it turns out. Uh, you wouldn't have traded if it was just worth $300. The only reason you do it is because you expect to get more value than 300 out of it. And Apple made a profit, so we both benefited, win-win. But we both went into the transaction for our own self-interest. <laughs> and generally, we know, we know as a culture, we know as a world, everybody knows this, that businessmen are selfish, right? We use this term selfish. They're selfish, they're self-interested. They're about money, and when they're not just about money, but they're also about passion and love and all those things, but they're all things that relate to them, not to you. Businessmen ain't business, they make their lives more interesting, their lives more fun, and their lives more profitable. But we also know about selfishness, what? That it's bad. We talked about this, right? Remember? Lying, stealing, cheating, SOBs. So we've got this category called selfishness. And in this category, we've got businessmen like Steve Jobs, who build stuff and create stuff, right? Who are making stuff to make money. And we've got lying, stealing SOBs, all in the same category. We use the same words to describe them both. So it's not surprising at all that most of us, I don't know if it's this room, but in the world out there certainly, most of us believe that most businessmen are lying, stealing SOBs. And we, we do believe that, whether you'll admit it or not, we do believe it. And how do I know we believe it? We believe it because we control and regulate them as if they're lying, stealing, and so on. The assumption behind every piece of regulation is if not for the regulation, these guys would screw us. I like to use the example of elevators in the US. You walk into an elevator in the United States, and there's a little diploma on the wall. And the diploma says that a government inspector inspected the elevator, and it won't fall and kill you. Because if not for government inspectors, businessmen would kill us every day. Because that's how you make money in free markets, by killing your customers. Now some of you believe this, so I know. Right? If there weren't food inspectors, McDonald's would poison us. Because that's how you make money, by poisoning your customers. So we need food inspectors, but notice, this is the implication, and we'll talk about the history of the Q&A, I promise. <laughs> this is the implication of the regulations, of the controls. The implication is a direct implication that these guys cannot be trusted. Why can't they be trusted? Because they're about money, because they're about self-interest, and self-interest equals line stealing and so forth. So what else? And we don't respect them for what they do, because again, it's tied up to this concept of self-interest. It's tied up to this idea that there's something bad about the essential feature of how they behave. So we take a businessman who's very successful, like Bill Gates. He makes lots of money, $70 billion. Makes lots of money. How does he make money? How do you make money? How do you make money in a market? By killing your customers? No, how do you do it? By satisfying your customers, by selling us something we value more than the price, right? We sell you a product that's worth more than the price we're charging for it, and yet we make a profit off of it because we're efficient, we're productive. So Bill Gates makes $70 billion for himself, for himself, then how much value is created in the world? You can't measure it, it's trillions of dollars. There's not a human being on the planet whose life is not better because of Microsoft. There's not a product out there that's not better because of computers, because of the internet, which were made possible by the standardization that Microsoft brought to the market. So here's a man, Bill Gates, who built a company that changed the world in profound, deep ways. And what do we think of it? Morally, 
Ethically, what do we think of? He's a nice guy. Yeah, he's a nice guy, but he's not a good guy. No, he's a great guy. He's a child to move. Wait, I haven't finished. He's a great guy. Why is he a great guy? When does he become a great guy? When he gives his money to charity, but when he's a businessman. When he's a businessman, you have plenty of time to do it. When he's a businessman, morally, morally, from an ethical perspective, nobody thinks he's a good guy. They think he's a great businessman. They think he's maybe created great products. But from an ethical perspective, nobody puts him on the same planet as I don't know, I'm other trees. Some saint, moral saint. He's not in the category of good from an ethical perspective. When does he become a good guy? When do we start thinking about him in moral terms? When he starts giving his money away. When he starts giving it away, then he becomes somebody that we admire, that we respect. He travels around the world, everybody loves him. Before, we were trying to put him in jail in America, doing everything we could. Now, well, we admire him, respect him, because he's giving his money away. Now, he's not a great man yet. Why? He still has a lot of money. He lives in a big house. What would it take to make him a great man? Our statues would be built, you know, would be would be created for him after he dies if he did what? He gave it all away, moved into a tent. And if you could just bleed a little bit for us, if you could show some sacrifice. If he could show that he was really noble and good and virtuous, if he could overcome the taint of being self-interested, then he's moral and good. But this is the ethical system we believe in. Implicitly, again, we don't articulate this explicitly. Implicitly, this is a system. We believe the nobility is giving, and sacrificing, and sharing. He's not sharing enough. He's still so wealthy. He could give much more of the money away. If he really wanted to, right? He's still being self-interested. That's why we don't think he's that great. And yet, to build a business like Bill Gates, you don't share, you don't give, you don't sacrifice. You build, you create, you trade. And you think about yourself. You think about how to make products better for you and for your company and for your supply chain because you have a selfish interest to do so. So business, we don't view morally as virtuous. We view business as morally eh, tainted. At best, morally neutral. At worst, morally bad. Charity, community service, volunteering work, anything where there's a perception that we're not getting anything in return, that's moral, that's virtuous, that's good. I once attended a, uh, a, uh, an awards dinner, Lifetime Achievement Award for business leaders. This was in Charleston, South Carolina, so you cannot blame these people for being leftists. This is the heart of conservative America. Right? And these guys had introductions, right? So they would introduce them. And these introductions were long because it was a Lifetime Achievement Award. So they would spend a minute on their business achievements and nine minutes on their charity and community service. Here are people who built businesses, who created stuff, employed people, took care of their own life, took care of the life of their family. And that counts for nothing. What really gives you virtue, what really makes you good, is the charity and community service you do. Even though, even though by any objective measure, you help more people by building a business, you change more lives by creating products, you change more lives by trading in the marketplace than you ever will. In community service. The world did not escape poverty because of charity. The world escaped poverty because of businesses making money, creating products. <laughs> One. One guy's on my side. That's good. So this is. This is where we are today. Our moral code, in my view, shapes the kind of world we live in. We don't trust businessmen, we regulate them, we control them, because we don't trust their self-interested motivation. We don't trust businessmen, we don't, we, 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 
It's not an issue of trust. We view businessmen as self-interested. They don't share enough. They don't give enough. So we take their money and we distribute it, call it the welfare state. But both of those, the welfare state, the regulatory state, the state as we know it in modern times today, is completely driven by a morality of selflessness. We want to give businessmen just enough freedom so they can produce enough so we can take it away from them and give it to somebody else. We realize enough that we need to leave them free at least to produce a little bit. But the purpose is not their own well-being. It's not their own goals. It's our ability to take their stuff and give it to somebody else. That's the purpose. That's the whole way we think about the world. It's all framed by this morality of selflessness. And nobody questions it. Nobody questions it. This is implicit. And I'm talking about nobody on the right, on the left, in the middle. Nobody's questioned it. Nobody indeed has questioned it since Aristotle. Except for Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand asks an important question. Why? Why is your life less important than your neighbor's? Why should you live for the sake of other people? Why is morality about serving, about sacrificing? Sacrificing is a lose-win, right? You give and you expect nothing in return. That's a loss. Why are lose-win relationships better than win-win relationships? Why should we live for others? Why is good defined as selfless? And she wrote, and she wrote a book about this, I recommend it to everybody, called The Virtue of Selfishness, where she articulates this, where she says no. She says no, the purpose of life isn't to serve, or shouldn't be to serve. It shouldn't be to share and to give and to sacrifice and to live for other people. Life is much too precious for that. Your life, every one of you's life, is much too precious for that. You should live for you, for yourself, for your own happiness, your own prosperity, your own well-being, your own flourishing. And the purpose of ethics as a science it's not to teach you how to be a slave, not to teach you how to be a servant, not to teach you how to live for other people, but to teach you how to live for you, making your life the best that you can live, be. That's what should be the purpose of ethics. It's what it was for Aristotle. Aristotle doesn't ask the question, what virtues lead to the best sacrifice? He asks the question, what virtues lead to the greatest eudaimonia in Greek, happiness, flourishing, for you as an individual. The whole purpose of ethics is on you. What should I do? How should I live? What should I think? How should I think? What action should I take to make my life, mine, the best life that it can be? That's the real question in ethics. That's the question ethicists should be asking themselves. And what is it? What is the thing that allows us as human beings to flourish, to be successful, to do good for ourselves, to produce iPhones, to produce desks, televisions, clothes? How about clothes? What is it? What is it that allows us all of that? Cheap money in China. Modern day slavery. Freedom. Wow, I mean, you guys are all off base. Self expression. Well, but what are you expressing? Right? What do you express? Look around the room. Look at your neighbor. You can look. It's okay. Well, I promise you we'll get to so called slave labor in China. I promise in the QA. Uh, look around the room. As a biological species, we are pathetic. <laughs> we're weak. We're slow. We have no fangs. We have no claws. You go running down a bison and try biting into it. You can't do it. Or you and a saber tooth tiger, who's going to win? We already won. We already won. So, how did we win? Because physically, not one of you would survive that battle. 
physically, we're pathetic. So what is it that makes it possible for us to sit here in the comfort of this room when it's rainy and cold outside and be warm and be comfortable and make fun of capitalists to make it possible for us to be warm and comfortable? The brain, our mind, our ability to reason. The only thing, the only thing that makes human and human species successful in this world is using our reason, using our mind. And only individuals use their mind. There's no collective brain. There's no collective mind. There's no collective reasoning. There's you, either using your mind or not using your mind, either succeeding in life or failing in life. That's what it boils down to. Life at the end of the day is about what you do with this. Think about it. I mean, does anybody here have a gene for making clothes? I don't. You put me on the wilderness, I have no idea how to make clothes. But somebody, thousands of years ago, the Einstein of his day probably, figured out that if you skin an animal in a particular way, and you dry the skin in a particular way, you could wrap yourself up with it and get warm. That was an act of genius, an act of reason, an act of using your mind. Agriculture, where does that come from? Somebody's going to yell out exploitation. Uh, <laughs> agriculture comes from somebody figuring out that a seed drops on the ground and if you water it, something grows out of it. An act of genius to figure out the connection between the two. You all take it for granted, I know. We all do. But somebody had to figure, be the first, figure it out for the first time. And then another genius, calling the Bill Gates of his day, would figure out how to take those seeds, sow them, and create a whole industry around it called agriculture. It probably took a thousand years between those two inventions. And we probably burnt them both at the stake. Because we hate people who come up with great ideas. That's human history. That's what moves this. That's what moves the human race. That's what makes progress possible. It's people using their brains, and in different ways. Some of us, thousands of years ago, were good hunters. Others might have been good clothes makers. And the hunters went out of hunts, and they brought back the skins, and the clothes maker made the clothes, and they traded. Win-win, just like I buy an iPhone. They traded meat for clothes. But the meat, the, the hunters had to figure out how to hunt. They had to build traps, they had to build weapons, all required. <laughs> Thinking, using your mind for your own survival, for the benefit of your own life. And then trading with other people for the benefit of your survival, for the benefit of your own life. All self-interested values. So to be truly self-interested is about thinking. It's about using your mind. It's about having reason, using your reason. And then acting on it. Because the fact is that we're not born with all the stuff that is necessary to feed ourselves. We have to produce, we have to create, we have to figure out agriculture, we have to figure out how to hunt, we have to figure out all these things, including how to make an iPhone, or how to make do something else so you can get the money so you can go and buy an iPhone. But we have to produce, we have to take care of ourselves. We're built for that. Again, you drop, you drop yourself into an environment in which people are not producing. Most of us, unless we really use our minds, would die. We're not built for physical survival. So if you really self-interested, Ayn Rand tells us, two important things you should be doing. One, think, 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 think. Observe facts, integrate them. Figure stuff out. Figure out what's good for you. Figure out what kind of life you want to live. And then act. Act to produce the things necessary for your own survival. Work. Work is not just some trivial thing that you go to make money at. Work is the sense that you get that you can take care of yourself. Work is the sense that you get that you're worthy of living. People get their self-esteem from their work. One of the great evils of the welfare state, there are many, but one of them is that we institutionalize people out of work. We encourage them never to work. 
We give them a check and tell them you're worthless. Don't work. Here's a check. You don't need to work. And what that does is destroys their soul. Because it destroys any knowledge that they can take care of themselves. That they're good enough to take care of themselves. That they're strong enough to take care of themselves. That they can think well enough to take care of themselves. Welfare destroys the poor because it institutionalizes them into a mentality of poverty. And it prohibits them from getting the self-esteem that allows us to be happy, to be successful, to be prosperous. That's why social mobility in the West is down, because the welfare state destroys it, annihilates it, creates barriers for people to rise up themselves by telling them they're worthless, which is exactly what the welfare said, state says to them. So to be truly self-interested, you think, you produce, you work, that production and work is necessary for self-esteem, it's necessary for your happiness, and then how do you deal with other people? Well, how did we deal with other people here? When I bought this, what did we do? Trade. We trade. You deal with other people through trade. Trade in material goods, trade in spiritual goods. Trade is win-win. I give and I expect to get something in return. Something more valuable than what I gave. Friendship is a trade. Try having a friend where it's one-sided and you never get anything in return. Unconditional friendship. Doesn't last. It doesn't. You guys are young. Same with love. What's more self-interested than love? I mean, the reason I love my wife is she give me so much. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's a virgin. He doesn't get. It's spiritual what she gives me, and physical, but it's a trade. Sex is a trade. If you're only one satisfied in sex, it ain't a good sex life. For you it is. <laughs> How's that? Now he's getting pussy. Imagine going out to your wife-to-be the day you're getting married and saying, look, honey, this is a sacrifice. You don't actually give me anything. I don't get anything out of this relationship. I marry you out of a sense of duty. It's completely selfless. That's absurd. The reason you marry somebody is they make you feel great because they give you a sense of yourself that nobody else in the planet gives you. That's what makes love such an amazing feeling. And it's mutual, hopefully. Otherwise, don't get married. But it's win-win. If it's not win-win, you wouldn't engage in it. I'm sorry for all those who have love relationships, sexual relationships, who are not win-win. I feel for you. You should try it sometime. It's pretty cool. It's an issue of trading. It's an issue of justice. What does justice mean? Today, justice somehow has evolved or been distorted into the notion that justice is equality. But justice is the opposite of equality. Justice is inequality. Justice is about treating people differently. Some people you love, you treat differently than people you don't love. Some people are incredibly productive, you pay them more than people who are not productive. Some people pay a lot of money to sit in first class seats, and they get first class treatment. Other people sit in, don't have the money, they don't get first class treatment. That's justice. Taking one person's money and giving it to somebody else to make them so-called equal, that is injustice. Treating somebody because they're good badly is injustice. I can give a quick example. How do you make me, everybody know who LeBron James is? Yeah. yeah. How do you make me and LeBron James equally basketball? I want to play one-on-one -on -one with LeBron James, and I don't think it's fair that he's so much better than me. So I want, I want an equal playing field. How do we do that? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, break his legs. Or cut his legs off. He's even more morbid than I am. 
right? You'd break his legs. Now, what would happen? He'd still be here. So we'd have to break his arms too. And then we could have a fagin. They would be just. Now, everybody says, oh, nobody can do that. That's horrible, breaking people's legs. But it's okay to take people's 50% of their income. It's okay to take people's time that they spend working hard to try to make a living, to try to create something, to build something, and then just take it from them. Every year, 50% of my income is gone. I don't even see it. I don't know. I might prefer having my legs broken once a year. If I got that 50% back, what's the difference? There's no difference. Both are incredibly painful. Believe me, when you make money, you don't know. So our whole perception of morality in Rand's view, my view, is wrong. It's upside down. You should be living for your life, for your happiness, which means you should be thinking, you should be producing, and you should be trading, treating other people with justice. Treating other people the way they deserve to be treated. And that only a free political system can achieve. So self-interest is the, is the way to happiness because its whole purpose is happiness, your happiness. It's the way to prosperity because it leaves people free and encourages them to produce. Because if they don't produce, nobody will produce for them. It's the way we become prosperous and it's the way we become happy. And lying, stealing, and cheating? That's not selfish. That's stupid. Anybody here lie? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> lying sucks. It's a waste of time. You never get what you want. You're usually caught, which ruins relationships, ruins your relationship with business, ruins personal relationships, ruins love relationships, Lying is like the stupidest strategy ever for cheating happens. So the fact that we associate being self-interested with lying is a scam. It's a scam by those who try to get us to be selfless, to sacrifice, because this is the story we've been told for 2,000 years. You've got two options in life. You can be selfless and sacrifice and be good. Or you can be a lying-stealing SOB, which means being self-interested. And I'm saying, that's nonsense. You can be selfless, which I think is bad. You can be a lying SOB, which I think is another form of bad and a form of self-destruction, bad for you. Or you can be selfish, self-interested, which means taking care of yourself, which means thinking about what is the best strategy to live. Nobody who thinks, thinks about the best strategy to live would ever lie still and cheat. It doesn't work. It's stupid. It destroys the one capacity you need, which is to reason and to think. Lying is a destructive strategy. Garbage in, garbage out. In computers, same thing with your brain. Lies are in, you get garbage out. You're destroying the machinery of your means for achieving happiness and success. So what I want to challenge today, what, I, what I'm trying to challenge you with, it's not the economic arguments. We can talk about the economic arguments. I'm sure most of the questions will be on that. For some reason, that's what people want to talk about. But that's just an outcome. That's just a consequence. That's not what matters in life. What really matters in life is what moral choices you make. Is what kind of morality you adopt. And ultimately, those moral choices will determine how you vote and what kind of politics and what kind of economics we all have. But much more important than that, it will determine whether you're happy, whether you're successful, whether you live a good life, and whether you believe that the, your purpose in life is to be good. Because most of us, and, and again, here I'll talk about Americans, because I know Americans, it, it's a little different. <laughs> Americans seem to live kind of self-interestedly. They go into business and try to make a lot of money. They pursue their life in semi-self-interested manner. And then they feel guilty because they should have been Mother Teresa. 
because their mother taught them that what was good and noble and just was selflessness and yet they've been selfish. And that rips them to shreds. And as they get older, they become more guilty. And even though they be successful like Bill Gates, even though they've made money, even though they've taken care of themselves, even though they've used their mind to be productive and traded, they feel bad about it. And that's what motivates them to do the charity and the community service and all that. Not because they really believe in it, not because they really think it's valuable, but because they feel guilty about the lives that they lead. You should be proud of what you build and what you create. You should be proud if you can create and build a business and make money. Making money is a noble activity. It's a virtuous activity. Because it's activity that enhances your life at nobody else's expense because you're trading. And when you trade, the other side is better off as well. Just like I'm better off having bought the iPhone in spite of paying 300 bucks for it. And I know this concept of trade is hard for you guys, but we'll get into it in the Q&A. Making money is good in and of itself if you're doing it through trading and not forcing other people, not using coercion. But the only party in the world we live in today, or the dominant party in the world we live in today that uses coercion, that uses force, that uses guns, that uses prisons, is government, not business. So be selfish because it's your life. Be selfish because you only have one shot at this life, one. I don't believe in reincarnation and afterlives. You got 100 years, you guys probably have 100 years on this planet to make the most of it. To live a life that you won't feel guilty about afterwards. To live a life that you'll feel happy about. Pride in. That you'll be able to grow old and satisfied. And enjoy the process. Enjoy every step of the way. Enjoy every day. Live. Live life fully. That's what it's about. That's what life should be about. That's what you should be taught, not sacrifice. Love. Love your work. Love the people you surround yourselves with. Love your life. Thank you all. Before, before we take questions, and we can take questions, and we have plenty of time. Um, just those of you who are curious and interested in more, virtue of self by Ayn Rand. Uh, Ayn Rand.org, A Y N R A N D.org, is a website with lots and tons and tons of information. Free videos, free courses, free content. There's a lot to learn. I just gave you scrape the surface of what's possible. Uh, so if you're interested, I hope some of you are. Go to the website, plus follow me on Twitter and Facebook. So, thank you uh, for the group. Uh, let's open the floor for questions. Absolutely. Who wants to be the first? It's always the There nice. we go, right there. I'm going to repeat the questions, because if we run around with one mic, it's going to be a problem. So speak up. Go ahead. Without the mic, because it, it'll take forever to wait for mics. Like your opinion. That's okay. I I'd be like, pretty shocked if you did. <laughs> yeah, I feel like um, selfishness it breeds other emotions. Like selfishness itself might not be bad in certain cases. So give me an but, example. Um, well, I'm from India, so I can give you the Indian example. <laughs> Gandhi was actually like from a pretty well-off family. If he had been selfish and followed like his course as a lawyer in South Africa, India would still be under oppression by the British. And um, as a product of that, I can only see two outcomes. Either India is oppressed, and Indians are oppressed, and the other one is Indians rise up against the British. And then you get so violence, and it's a bad yeah, Okay, so I get, the, I get the point. So Gandhi, uh, a selfish thing for Gandhi to do would have be been to continue to be a lawyer and go and make money, right, be a successful lawyer. But he chose, instead of that, to do something selfless, and to lead the Indian nation to independence in a peaceful way, which resulted in lots of good things. And, I, you know, and let's just assume 
that the setup is true. That is, that everything you said is true. I'm not an expert in any history, so I don't know. See, part of the problem is that the way we be taught about selfishness is to assume that selfishness equals money. But selfishness doesn't equal money. It equals pursuing the values, the rational values, that are going to make your life the best life that it can be. Many people choose to get, have less money. So I'll give you an example. I mean, I'll give you a personal example. I got a PhD in finance. I had job office on Wall Street, and I, and I had job office in academia. Clearly, Wall Street would have made me a lot more money. I would, I would be a millionaire today, many times over. I chose to go into academia. Why? Because I love teaching. I love this stuff, if you can't tell. Right? <laughs> I love this stuff. You can't buy this stuff. You can't buy what we're doing right now, from my perspective. You can give me millions of dollars. This is what I want to do. I don't want the money. And that, to me, is the most selfish thing I can do. It's not about money. It's about what are your values? What are your rational values? Now, let's say Gandhi. I mean, I don't know Gandhi, so this is imaginary, right? Because in Gandhi, money how to be selfish. You know, but if he was. A peaceful resolution to India, a place where he grew up, where his entire family is, where the people he loves lives, where he is going to live, was more important to him than money. Now, I'm not saying it was a selfish decision, because I don't know what went inside his head, but it could be a selfish decision. Don't associate selfishness with money. Just like Steve Jobs doesn't only make this for money. Now, by the way, I get paid for doing this. So I'm not doing it for free, and I wouldn't do it for free. I mean, SFL's not paying me. My institution's paying me a salary. This is my job. I wouldn't do it for free, so I'm still in it for the money, but I'm willing to give up a lot of money to get the pleasure, the fun, of educating minds. Right? Now, some of you think corrupting, but I think educating minds. Uh, just like Steve Jobs wanted to make money doing this, but he also wanted to make something beautiful that wasn't about money. Now, he wouldn't have made, he needed both. So, one of the corrupting influences of this other morality right, is to make you think of selfishness, not just lying, stealing, SOP, but money. It's funny, the left, I'll just generalize, left Marxism generally, is the most material, money-obsessed group I've ever met. And it's people like me who love capitalism, who love free market, who love freedom, who care a lot less about money. Money's less important. There's a lot of things more important than money to me. And money's good. A lot of things more important than money. But the left can only think about money. Dialectic materialism, it's called, not dialectic spiritualism or anything else. Yes. Uh, should I just point? I don't know where the mic is. I don't know. Oh, sorry. I don't know. I already have. Yeah. Uh, I have two comments first, and, and then afterwards some questions. My first comment is that it uh, seems that we're already in nature, you know, about 1% of, uh, of people are, are born, you know, as your perfect type, you know, unable to feel compassion for other people, uh, they're called psychopaths, but uh, it, seems, it seems like they, they, the, the things that they have in their personality corresponds quite a lot with, with the inside. Another point I would like to make is that uh, that Mother Teresa was not a great person, as everyone would say. Good. But, uh, Thank you. She, she was quite a horrible person who yeah. wanted to, if anything, keep the, the people of the Lord in poverty forever. And so, pointing to her as being, you know, the pinnacle of good people. Uh, no, no, no. I don't think she's, she's a good person. I think the culture thinks she's a good person. She's a horrible yeah, person. She was for lots of reasons, among others, what you just said. Sure. I agree completely. My last comment on my question is that, uh, I mean, if we're going to try to create, create a society where we optimize the happiness of people, and you see more government taxation as, as a problem in that. I do wonder why the people of Denmark seems to be so much happier than the people of Somalia. Somalia has virtually no state. Uh, the people of Denmark has quite a lot of state. Uh, it seems it seems kind of counterintuitive to what you're promoting that that the most regulated and taxed people in the world should be coincidentally that the happiest people in the world. Great question. Great question. Uh, 
in spite of the insult. Um, nothing I said excludes compassion. The idea that people who are self-interested are not compassionate people is something you just made up to devise a, a straw man that was never mentioned and doesn't even exist. So, the, you know, I talked a lot about love. Love involves compassion. There's lots of things that involve compassion. Compassion is a value, one of many values. Compassion does not require sacrifice. Indeed, most people who sacrifice, like Mother Teresa, feel no compassion. Feel no compassion. It's people who are capitalists who feel the most compassion. But let me answer your question about happiness of the Danes, because it's kind of funny. Uh, so first, nobody is right mind. Well, some people, but they're not in their right minds. Nobody in his right mind uses Somalia as an example of anything good in the world. And suddenly, my example didn't say, oh, if there was only no government, everything would be great. I'm a great believer in government. I'm not an anarchist. I never use Somalia as an example of anything good, anything. Uh, I believe in government that does a few things and does them really well. It does the protection, the definition of protection of property rights, it does policing, it does military. Three things that don't exist in Somalia. When those three, three things are done well, you get happy societies like Denmark. We'll get to the welfare part of that in a minute. Like Hong Kong, which has no welfare state, but people are pretty happy, other than with the lack of with the lack of democracy. Because okay, it's a peace mission, but but this is the funny thing about Hong Kong. Seventy years ago, seventy years ago, Hong Kong was a fishing village in which about thirty to fifty thousand people lived. Today, Hong Kong has seven and a half million people. Those people weren't born in Hong Kong. Right? They came from all over Asia. They risked their lives to come to Hong Kong. They swam, they went on rafts, they went on little boats from all over Asia to come to Hong Kong. Why? Hong Kong had no safety net. Because they had opportunities, because they had protection for property rights, and they could make something of their lives. Now they've reached a point where they want to vote too. Good for them, and I support that completely. But just property rights without a vote drew 7 million people into Hong Kong. 7 million people. They never had to vote. Under the British, they still didn't have the vote. They were ruled by a governor. And yet, they still flocked to Hong Kong. So it's the property rights that drew them there. Now, it's funny about Scandinavians. Scandinavians are happy people. When you go around asking Scandinavians if they're happy, they all say, yes, we're very happy. It's funny because if you ask Scandinavians in America if they're happy, they say they're even happier than Scandinavians in Scandinavia. <laughs> It's true. On the other hand, I'm, I'm from a Jewish origin, right? I was born in Israel. If you ask Jews if they're happy, they never say yes. <laughs> we don't, culturally, it's unacceptable. You say no, go complain. I mean, the studies that measure happiness are so bogus and so funny and so distorted. I mean, really. Now, even on the level of economic freedom, Denmark, uh, you know, they, uh, these organizations put out um, uh, economic freedom indexes, which countries are the most economically free and which are less economically free. Denmark scores very high. The United States is well below Denmark. The United States is less economically free than Denmark. So it's true Denmark has high taxes. But it doesn't only have high taxes. It has strong rule of law, strong protection of property rights, low regulations. Danish businesses and banks are far less regulated than American ones. And generally, it's more economically free than America. So it's very murky in this world of lots of mixed economies that measure relative economic freedom and relative happiness, particularly when you take into account when you, could control, when you don't control for the million other variables that are going on, like culture and, and expect, social expectations and all these other things. Uh, the example of Somalia is good. Nobody's happy in Somalia. Nobody should be happy in Somalia. Somalia is a disaster by all of our standards. We can agree on that. At least. Next question. Yes. Um, my question would be, do you not see a problem in the threat duty of the commons? Or do you not believe in that? No, so I, I, I think there is a tragedy of the commons. And the tragedy is that we have commons. 
Commons are dirty. Commons are not treated well. You saw that when the wall came down 25 years ago between East Berlin and West Berlin. The commons in communism were filthy. It was the most polluted place on the planet, far more polluted than Western Europe was. I mean, that was the first thing that struck visitors when they crossed over to Eastern Europe, is how filthy everything was, how polluted everything was. And the reason was, it was the commons. There was no private property. The solution to the commons is not to have any, which means private property, which means, I know, which means you privatize. Yeah, but, but what is the environment? Put aside global warming for a second. What is the environment other than global warming? Let's put global warming aside for a minute. I'll talk about global warming. I'm not trying to evade the question. I just want to separate it out into units so we can discuss it intelligently, which is un unusual, I know, but... <laughs> what is an, an environmental example? Fish stocks. Well, the best way to deal with fish stocks as people have already started experimenting in Iceland and in Norway, pretty, pretty, collect, pretty social estates, is by privatizing them. By, by, yes, by creating uh, private units to measure how much you take it and you own it. And you can trade these units and it's actually sold the fish stock problems. And there are other ways in which you can privatize the fish in the oceans to protect those fish stocks. You know, I'll give you another example. Fishes, elephants. Elephants are becoming extinct in Africa. And then they found a solution. You know what the solution is? Private elephants. <laughs> private, no. Well, you won't let me answer, right? So you create private reserves in which the owners have an incentive to protect their elephants from poachers because they make money at it, either through visitors or through organized hunts. But if you hunt an animal and there's profit in it, there are more of that animal to be had. Of what? Carbon no. Trading. So what's that? Carbon trading. Yes. So you're asking about global warming. Yes. When there's a problem. The question. The question is, would I be in favor of carbon trading? Because didn't I say fish stocks are a form of carbon trading, right? Because you've got a fish stock, you, you, get, a, you get a piece of the, of the action, if you will, and then you can trade it and develop it. Wouldn't I apply that to carbon trading? If I believed carbon was a problem, if I thought the solution was to reduce consumption of carbon, even if it was a problem, if I thought the reduction of carbon was the solution, then carbon trading is the right approach to have. If, if, if. I don't necessarily think it's a problem, I'm not a scientist. I'm not gonna make a definitive statement about it, but neither are you guys, but you guys have been brainwashed into this. 98% of scientists don't believe that. It's another feature of your brainwashing is you believe the 98% of scientists believe this. Every study shows the 98% of scientists do not believe this. What? But. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> That's a nice, nice Nice use of math. <laughs> Let me finish. You can disagree with me. You're going to disagree with me. That's fine. Let me finish. For decades, for decades, the environmentalist movement has been feeding us one catastrophic scenario after another. I'm a finance guy. I'm a finance guy. You come to me and you want me to invest, I ask you what your track record is. And if you tell me that every investment you've ever made, you've lost money, I don't invest in you. So I look at the environmentalist movement. I'm not a scientist. I don't know the, the numbers, right? right? I look at the environmentalist movement, and I study it going back. And I look at what they say about DDT, which scientists 20 years later said was untrue. I look at what they say about global cooling. Remember, you guys don't remember global cooling, but some of us do because we're old enough. In the early 70s, the Earth was going to quote front page of the New York Times, all the scientific magazines, 98% of the scientists believe the globe was going to cool. It didn't. 1968, the famous book came out by Paul Ehrlich, one of the great, great environmentalists that people still worship to this day, that said that hundreds of millions of people were going to die of starvation during the 70s 
because of overpopulation. It didn't happen. So when I look at these things, these string of failures, I am skeptical. I'm skeptical of what they tell me next about the end of the world. The end of the world ain't happening. No, I'd love to hear about the successes, but <laughs> love to sometimes. I'm talking about catastrophic losses. Let me keep going. Now, let's say, let's say that they're right. Let's say the globe is warming. Let's say it's all true. I'll grant you it all. I'll grant you the carbon that human, the human beings are causing the warming that stopped 14 years ago for some bizarre reason, but 16 years ago. But let's say it's still happening. What's the solution? Now, I, I can guarantee you one thing, that the solution cannot be, should not be, must not be, stop using carbon fuels. Because what that actually means is stop living. Because it does. You can laugh, but everything, you can, everything around you is made of carbon, fuels, of oil, of natural gas, the plastic of the chairs you're sitting on, this bottle, this cup, most of the most of the synthetics in your clothes are made from carbon. Most of the stuff in this room is made from oil byproducts. Stop using oil. Stop refining oil. I might as well go back 300 years to when we were all poor, we were all starving, we were all subsistence farming. Children died before the age of 10. Life sucked. Carbon emissions are created while you refine the oil to create the plastic. Where do you think carbon emissions come from? The whole process is about carbon emissions. You know when you stop emitting carbon? This is where, this is where people, you lose people. You stop emitting carbon when you're dead. Only time when, you, when your footprint is zero. And I guess some people like that. They want us to have a zero footprint. Yes? Um, yes, I was wondering how you define coercion because in the last part of your lecture you were more or less um, you implied that uh, governments have a monopoly on coercion since they can actually enforce law on people. But in my opinion, I think that money is one important uh, way of coercing other people. So there's there's an important distinction in my view between two types of force. Or, or two types of power, put it that way, two types of power. Political power and economic power. Political power is about guns. It's about grabbing you and moving you somewhere you don't want to go. Economic power is about providing you with values voluntarily. You do not have to buy an Apple product. You do not have to buy a phone. You do not have to use carbon fuels. You can go live in the woods. You have, it's your choice to participate or not participate, to trade or not to trade. That is very different. And that is not coercion. Money is not coercion. The only way I can get your money is by offering you something that you value more than your money. When somebody sells you bread for $2, you value the bread for more than $2, so you're willing to trade for it. Nobody coerced you. You chose to use that $2 to buy the bread. When I offer you an iPhone, nobody coerces you to buy it. You give me your money voluntarily because you want something more valuable to you than that money. So money is not coercive. Money is voluntary, and if you're smart about it, money buys you an improved quality of life, an improved living standard, and that's always the case. Um, my question is, I don't know where the microphone is. Oh, there it is. Yes. Okay. Hey, um, so you've, um, you say that money is a good thing, and my question is, well, if, um, I mean, if the individual is always striving to get more money into their bank account and economically be more stable, I think that the, the capitalist system itself, the competition is an inherent aspect of that, and you know, that, that kind of supports the selfish and you know, striving for your own personal development. Yeah. But isn't there with competition a race to the bottom? And with that, don't you think a race to the bottom kind of eliminates a lot of people? And you say that everyone can kind of achieve this economical stability and you know, be in that. Yeah. Don't you think it's more 
Yeah. If you're born or developed in the right interest, then you'll you'll be good economically. But otherwise, I don't think universally we're all going to be economically. Okay. okay. I think that is so. Let me let me deal with two aspects of what you're asking. One, uh, 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 competition is a race to the bottom. That's bizarre because in every in every really competitive market where we leave the market free, 